Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. The impossible happened! I would have never thought I would ever see the day that UPS delivers something early? <laughs> so I bought these guitars from my buddy and uh, we decided to do the three day select air so it would get here before the weekend cuts off and then UPS shuts down. Because typically their stuff doesn't move much on Saturday and Sunday unless they're like really backed up and they're working overtime. As far as I understand it anyways, I've never worked at UPS. I don't know the inside story. That's just kind of what I've seen as far as, you know, shipping guitars. So normally in cold weather, I'll hold guitars back and ship on like Mondays and Tuesdays. That way they don't spend the weekend with UPS. However, now that things are starting to warm back up, that's not as big of a deal. So inside here we have not one, but two new Les Paul Customs. New to me, not necessarily new, these are all from the 70s and 80s. My friend was a little bit short on boxes, so he asked me which one that I wanted to be sent first, and I was like, you know those reverb boxes are pretty big, I bet you could fit both of them in there, and he's like, yep, sure enough, it worked out. And let me tell you guys, it's a lot cheaper to do it this way. My only concern is that the package weighs twice as much, 45 pounds or so. In theory, that could lead to, you know, if they drop it because it's so heavy that you could get damaged guitars. So it's kind of a trade off. You basically can ship two for the same price of one. Just make sure you insure it and you pack them well like this. Okay, so we get an old 70s style Gibson case. I love the ones that have the Gibson badge like that. The very iconic Norlin era font with the little water spurt flower. I'm not quite sure what they were trying to go for there. But other than that, I really don't like these cases all that much. Maybe they were good when they were brand new, but anymore they don't have a lot of padding to them. They're just not my favorite. I much prefer the Gen 1 and 2 chainsaw cases, but we'll take a look at that one in a minute. So inside here to check out today briefly, and what makes this one so nice is it's stock chrome hardware. Wow, the neck on this. I don't know if it's just because it's been a while since I've dealt with a whole bunch of Norlin era Gibsons, but this neck feels ultra slim. Like even the ones that I've had, like this is a really skinny neck. Where was this made? Kalamazoo? Yeah. So if you remember the unboxing episodes where my buddy sells me guitars, they're always black Les Paul Customs. That's his favorite guitar, so he's got so many of these things, but he's kind of uh, moving his collection around and stuff. So I always help him sell some of them off when he's ready, but a Kalamazoo Late 77. This is actually a really nice guitar. I think he said uh, one of his buddies in a band used this to do some recording. I forget what the band name was called, but I'll throw it up here on the screen. I would definitely call this more so player's grade. It looks like at some point in time, somebody actually had one of those diamond posi-lock strap buttons on here from the 80s, or some other strap button that has some uh, grippers right there. And pretty much the biggest area of wear on this guy is like the strap or whatever was here, just kind of a uh, rub through our finish. But yeah, this feels nice. Really lightweight. Like the body itself is light. I'll have to throw this thing on the workbench, that's for sure. And in this corner, what kind of black custom do we have this time? If you take into account the case, it would be a 78 through about an 82-ish. So let's see which one we got. Ooh, another one with chrome hardware. Let me know in the comment section what you guys feel about chrome hardware on black customs. I kind of like it. But I can also see why some people would want the full on gold. But this one, wow, the lacquer's really aged on it. Look at that. Nice. It's really dark and ambered, but it doesn't have the smoky scent, which sometimes you gotta watch out for that if you're allergic to smoke when you have a guitar that's this aged looking, because normally that's because there's a lot of nicotine on the surface that's discolored it. Sometimes it can just be sunlight that's faded it and made it turn colors, but this one, I don't know what caused it to turn colors, but it's a nice dark ambered hue on it. So I think after, you know, a nice little cleanup job, this one is supposed to be the cleaner condition one. It's a 1979, about midway through the year, but this one is Nashville in production. The body's a little bit heavier on this guy, not quite as lightweight feeling anyways, but at the end of this episode, I'll actually throw these guys on the workbench and we'll take an individual look at the parts and specs, kind of do a quick comparison on them because, you know, Black Les Paul Customs from two different factories, we might as well check them out. 
Okay, and now we have one last one to unbox today. It's nice doing a, an unboxing episode like this. I've kind of swapped up my styles to the point where we just kind of unbox, review, and demo. That way I don't get stuck with a big backlog of guitars. I'm not as excited, you know, starting the episode for the second time. Because I used to just unbox these and not even talk about them. But then I started to talk about them because I like, you know, teaching you guys something. It's not just mindless unboxing. But it just, it doesn't quite work out. So normally in the unboxing unboxing series now, it's simply stuff that I buy to resell or to teach a small lesson about. Now this shop did a fantastic job packing this thing. Here we go. Gen 3 chainsaw case. Hey, we even have the Gibson badge. That's always a good thing. We have all our latches. One, two, three. Nice. Inside here is a model. I've already reviewed, but I actually got it as like a, uh, somebody sent me the guitar to forward them. So it wasn't my guitar when I reviewed it, but this one, ooh, wow. That's nice. What is this thing you ask? Well, it is the Gibson XR2. Now it's kind of an old review and demo and it was in a different color, but you can check that video out right here. It was more of like a honey burst color, whereas this is a very traditional 70s, 80s, like clown burst type cherry sunburst. But what the XR2 is, is it actually gets like a flame maple veneer on top. Like it's a very thin top, but you get the figuring and it's a, a flat top deluxe, essentially. They look so strange <laughs> like this, but they have these mini humbuckers that are really freaky in the fact that you can coil split them. So they're very unique and interesting guitars. And XR stands for extended range. And this was the second one. XR1 and XR3 actually have humbucker pickups depending on which one you got. You would either have Dirty Fingers or you could have Tim Shaw PAFs and the number three. Nice. It even it's got some flame figuring on here. The condition on this is clean. I have no regrets buying this one. You're probably curious what this thing is. Why does it look all weird? That's the nine point adjustment bridge. So you can level that out if you want to. The whole reason why I bought this is I wanted to take the knobs off for my Sparkle Top Deluxe. These are not the knobs I'm looking for. I was kind of scared that might be it. I'm not sure if these have actually been replaced or not. It's probably just a, a different variety. Yeah, they're definitely the vintage originals, but that's not what I need for a mid 70s deluxe. I kind of thought that might be the case though, because let's face it, this is a, what, an 81? So it's a little bit late. But that's okay, because this thing is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I would almost say collector's grade, if it wasn't for the fact that somebody took a sliver off of the headstock right there. There's a ding up here too. Personally, I would touch that up. It looks like we've got the common uh, bubbling of the lacquer around the tuners as well. So it, it's not perfect, but I mean, if you've been looking for a rather clean XR2, you can check this one out on my website, drogglysguitarshow.com. Man, that's a nice example though. No regrets buying it, even though it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Like, geez, this case is so clean. Like normally these ribbons have broken off or they don't fully hold the lid up or they kind of tilt back too far but I have never had one that's been so new that it still has these little bumpers here that keeps it in place. <laughs> this case must not have been used too much. It must have just sat under someone's bed. But let's go ahead and uh, check out these Les Pauls on the workbench. This is why I stopped buying old guitars. You know, I was getting ready to verify all the parts, but I thought, you know what? I might as well check the neck because I asked the guy, is the neck straight? Is the truss rod good? I even had him send me a photo and he's like, yep, it's all good. They're saying they're a musician shop, but unfortunately, no. This neck has quite a sizable twist on the opposite direction that I normally see. So our bass side is significantly lower than the treble side. I mean, you can see that twist right there. I mean, this is a visible twist. Even just looking down like right here, you can see how the neck just kind of falls. Now, if you raise the action up a little bit, I mean, it's still playable, it's okay. It's honestly still an all right guitar, but necks are not supposed to be twisted. And if it's twisted, just disclose it. You know, there's still people who buy twisted neck guitars because they're a lot cheaper. Now, to be fair, missing a twisted neck, it happens to the best of us. Sometimes you'll look and you're holding the guitar wrong so you don't catch it. But the true test of a seller is how they make it up to you.
So inside here, we have our original T-top pickups dating to 1978. This one looks like it says August 25th, 1978. Pickup cavities look the way I would expect to see for this era. Original Gibson Schaller made bridge and original full weight tailpiece. And the original pick guard here with the awesomely aged knobs. I love these things. They look good. But we'll run the light along just in case you are interested in this. So you got some scratches, some nicks and dings. This area is actually pretty good, surprisingly, because that's where most of your picking wear should be. I mean, when you get it like this, you can see some polishing scratches and picking wear. But it's right here where there's a lot of nicks and dings. So it is far from a mint condition custom, but this is something that looks good once you really polish it up. I just did a nice light cleaning here. And these will have three piece maple tops with mahogany bodies that are not weight relieved because they didn't start doing that quite yet. And here we have our 22 frets. You can definitely see there is some fret wear pretty much all the way up and down on this thing. If you're really picky with your frets, you might consider a level recrown job. This is probably the absolute worst area. That's on the fourth fret under the G string. It looks much worse in the photos than it actually feels. But the frets in this era are low and wide, so it just might be time for a refret depending on how picky you are. But I think you can definitely get away with just a level recrown job on this. If you even want that, I'm sure you can play it just fine as is too. I do want to say playability is good on this. I don't notice any crazy fret buzzing. So you definitely don't have to do anything with these frets right away. But you know, if you're really, really picky, that's why I mentioned the level recrown. But our truss rod's good. The neck is straight on this one and super aged up here. Moving on to the back, you get a perfect looking control cavity. You've got pots dating to 78 and 79. Correct capacitors in here. Nothing looks like it's ever been touched. Very nice. You even still have the shielding tin. But you can tell this was definitely somebody's player. You got lots of nicks and dings. There's kind of a large one right here that was touched up at one point in time. So definitely player's grade here, but nothing too ugly, except for uh, one thing that I kind of found funny. So along the edges, I somebody was drunk at the factory when they installed these strap buttons. Do you see how off center that is? Not only on one, but on the other one as well. And it's not like a, a fill and read drill type of job, no. That's how it left the factory. That's hilarious. Some guy must have got trained wrong or was let loose a little bit too early in Nashville. But you can see some uh, scuffs and uh, there is a ding on the binding. But I'll let you take a look at the rest that you might see here. But at least the neck itself is actually in pretty clean shape. You get some light impressions, but nothing that you're really gonna feel while you play it. But you get your Volute, regular Gibson style tuners, and once again, your serial number dating to 1979. So kind of a cool player's grade black Les Paul Custom. This one's about 10 and a half pounds. Let's go ahead and switch over to that Kalamazoo build. This one's actually a little bit cleaner, but has a few more significant issues with it. The first one we'll start with here. He thought it was just kind of like a ding or something. No, those are definitely cracks. This thing got whacked at some point in time and lightly cracked the wood right there. Thankfully, they didn't spread all the way up and most of it is covered by the poker chip, but there's also kind of a small one right there. Is it going to cause you any issues? Doubt it but it is there. I'm not sure if it was ever repaired or not, but it doesn't look too bad, all things considered. But you got your scratches, your nicks and dings. It's also a three-piece maple top, just like the other one. But remember, this one is a Kalamazoo-made one, and the binding is not as aged. These witch hat knobs, they're replacements. Take a look at that. We actually have a transitional neck tenon. When they were switching between long necks to short necks, there was this transitional neck tenon, which is just kind of like a combination of both, where you can actually see the tenon of the neck. Usually there's wood completely surrounding that, like we just saw in that other one. So that's kind of a unique feature on that one. And it looks like uh, somebody had different pickups in here at one point in time, because there are different screw holes drilled in uh, two locations on this guy. But thankfully, we have original T-tops in here, November 1977 and November 11th, 1977. Something else you'll notice, this Kalamazoo build does not have as deep of a pickup route. I've never noticed that before. Bridge, same as the last one, Schaller made in Germany. 
Moving on from there, we get the ebony fretboard. Things are actually looking pretty good on this one. This was mainly somebody's like a rhythm player. So starting around like the seventh, eighth fret, you can start to see some wear, especially up here in the cowboy court area. It looks scary, but when you start looking level, you can just see it's some minor flattening. So once again, same recommendation on this one, do a level recrown if it really bothers you, but I don't think you're gonna have any issues as is. So once again, there's fret wear, but it's not necessarily affecting playability the way it's currently set up but your own personal setup may vary. So just keep that in mind. But we do have a crack in the fretboard right here at the second fret. I don't really see that's going to expand. Just make sure you condition your fretboard just like you normally do when you take your strings off and change them and it won't spread. You could technically fill that in with like some ebony wood filler or like uh, just shave some ebony and then glue that in if you're really bothered by it. But thankfully, those are the only two cracks I found on this guitar. Since it has such a tiny feeling neck, I want to get these measurements. 1.67 inches at the nut. 2.05 by the 12th. I'm, is it like 7.7? Seven, seven? Well, I guess it's not too bad. 0.82 at the first. And at the 12th, 0.95. That, that's misleading. This is a really skinny neck. Still C-shaped, but very skinny. Straight neck on this guy, maple neck, truss rods in perfect shape, and a beautifully lightly aged headstock. That's a nice guitar. This originally probably would have came with reflector knobs. So something like this. That's just from my parts drawer. So it would also look similar, but witch hats, witch hats are always cool. Moving on to the backside, there's some interesting stuff in our control cavity. Okay, so this is definitely proof of the pickups being, you know, in and out. So it's the original style that's in here, but there's definitely been other stuff, but nothing has been messed with as far as the caps go. The pots are original, but you'll see that they actually cut the bridge pickup just a little bit too short. So they have these little jumper wires putting them to where they go. So it still works. It's just if you wanted to install that properly, you would have to extend this lead. As is common on these customs, this screw has stripped out, so it's missing. And we're also missing one of the screws for the ashtray cover. But looking at the back, you got lots of buckle worming on this guy. Lots of it. But thankfully, not too many broken finish areas. That's what I hate, is when the finish gets broken. I mean, you've got like this really deep impression. And of course, on the edge, you know, this is an area of broken finish because it's been rubbed through. I would suggest filling and re-drilling this one whenever you decide whatever strap buttons you want to put on this guitar because it doesn't quite fully tighten down. Like, it's secure, it's not spinning, but you can keep turning that and turning it. It needs a more secure fit. It's either that or you just get a larger screw. But you definitely have wear and tear on the edges of this guy. But hey, at least the Kalamazoo guys know how to drill it within the center. <laughs> I've never seen a Les Paul Custom have that badly drilled in strap buttons. That's just so funny to me on that other one. But lots of nicks and dings over here as well. But thankfully, like, no cracks in the body back here or in the neck. There is a little bit of finish wear to the edge of the neck. Nothing too bad. And there are some impressions, specifically right there. There's a little area of finish that's worn through, so you can kind of see the neck right there too. It's mainly just the lacquer that's different because the yellowness has kind of been worn through in that area because it's been played so much. Another difference of the KZ Customs is you get the tortoiseshell dot inlays. It doesn't look like it, but if you get them in the light just right, there is a little bit of red to them. That's why most people don't even realize that's a difference. KZ made ones always get these giant volutes, but you know, everything else pretty similar. Made in USA stamped vertically. You'll notice that other one we had, it didn't even have one. Sometimes that happens. Other times it was just stamped so lightly the finish covers it. But that's a 1977 Gibson Les Paul Custom. Let's find out how much it weighs. 9 pounds, 12 ounces might not sound lightweight, but for a Norlin era Les Paul Custom, that's pretty all right. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed today's unboxing episode. Once again, I am now selling direct on my website anything that is featured on my show. And you can check out my inventory at troglysguitarshow.com as well as book a private help session. Take care.